Filmmaker in Focus is a podcast featuring the filmmakers of the Maine Outdoor Film Festival. Coming up on this episode, David Stiles, filmmaker of the 2022 selection, Flow. The Maine Outdoor Film Festival is an annual celebration of outdoor adventure, conservation, and film held each summer in Portland. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Maine Outdoor Film Festival's Filmmaker in Focus. I'm Meg Friel. I'm going to be speaking today with David Stiles, filmmaker of the film Flow, a 2022 Maine Outdoor Film Festival selection. I'm going to slide on into David's studio now. David, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about your film. Tell us about Flow. Flow is a, you know, just a, a profile on a, you know, a, a trail building crew in Maine and kind of it morphed into a little bit of a, a story about, I guess, trail building in general and uh, the, the evolution of mountain biking over the years um, as far as like from a trail access standpoint. So it was just a, an idea that came across uh, my mind and I asked someone and they gave me money to do it. So I was like, well, yeah, off we go. Let's check out a short clip from David's film, Flow. I grew up right around here, riding all sorts of different types of trails. I thought I was pretty good. And then when I went out west and wanted to become an instructor, I just came away with like, this is a different sport. This is something completely different than what I was doing. I already loved mountain biking, but it made it fully, fully hooked on it. And my entire crew, every one of them was like, I built trails in my backyard. I can't believe that I could actually get paid to do this. And I was like, yeah, me too. So David, tell us a little bit, is this a passion project for you? What uh, inspired you to do this film? You know, it started with, with just this idea of wanting to be up in Maine. You know, I'm from New Hampshire. I grew up on the seacoast and um, I kind of wanted to just shoot a film up, up that way. I live in Charlotte, North Carolina now. I got some friends up in, in New England and, um, you know, this friend of mine is a, is a, owns a trail building company and, uh, and I just asked if, you know, he'd be interested in doing some sort of a profile piece on him and on it. And it, it made a lot of sense to do it. And, uh, and, you know, I have some contacts at Pearl Zumi and, and, you know, I've made a few films for them now. And, and I reached out to them and just said, Hey, would you be interested in some sort of a trail building, you know, film around that? And, and they were into the idea as long as the community was involved. And so that, you know, made me stretch out a little bit more and, and look at what the trail building itself did for the community and what that did in, in, and how it changed things from really when I was a kid and, you know, kind of bopping around in the woods and, and, and that sort of thing. So it all kind of came together in, in a couple of months, I think, and, and Pearl was on to the idea and they liked it. And, and it, I think it came out pretty good. There was a, um, there's a lot of, a lot of little nuanced shoots that we did over the course of like a week and a half, two weeks while I was up there and, and it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. It had a blast. Yeah, I, I loved the film. Um, I especially think it's important what you touched on as it being a part of the community. Could you talk a little bit about like, I'm interested to know, like how they get permission to build these trails? Well, so, you know, that's not really my specialty. Um, you, you'd want to talk to main trail builders about how they actually do that stuff. But I, I do know that there's they work for municipalities as well as working for private um, landowners. So there's there's some private land that um, you know they've built a lot of stuff with. But then there's also grants and other sources of funding through I believe the the conservation fund might be one of them. But you know there's land that's being set aside all over the country really um, that they're they're designated as as not a a wilderness area, but it's actually being designated as like more of a community type area. And one of the things they do on these pieces of land is, um, is build mountain biking trails because it's really low impact and, um, and gets people out using the woods in the way that they want them to. Um, so you'd, you'd have to ask, uh, uh, Stu Johnson at Maine Trail Builders, uh, what, how they actually get it. But I do know that the film itself 
they basically go into meetings now with like cities. They went into the meeting meetings with like Freeport or the city of Portland, and they'll just press play and, and play the video. And they're like, so do you want to do a project? And it just sells it for them. And that was one of my goals with it was like, I wanted to give them some promotional piece because I really like what they're doing. Um, and they started partnering with some other organizations that are building trails um, up in, in Northern Maine, up near Rangeley or somewhere in that area. I can't remember exactly where. Um, so yeah, I think I answered that question. I can't remember exactly yeah. what it was. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's great that they get to use the film to sort of help expand on this and, and develop it. Okay, could you talk a little bit about um, the film itself? There's a lot of action shots with it. You're outdoors a lot of the time. What are some of the shots you're most proud of, and, and what were some of the most complicated shots for you to find on this film? Great question. Um, you know, I think one of my favorite shots is um, at, at the end of the film, kind of when the when the credits are about to roll, there's a, a long tracking shot uh, where a, a bunch of bikers are kind of snaking through the woods and we're, we're traveling along this road with them. And, um, and we shot the whole thing at a, I think we shot it at 120. We might've shot it at 300 frames a second. I can't remember, but it was, it was maybe a, a 15 second drive like down this dirt road. So we were going down this hill in the in my van and one of my assistants was driving and I was shooting out. Actually, the producer of the film, Izzy Olgard, was driving and um, that might be a lie. It might have been her friend that was there. I can't remember. Either way, someone was driving and I was like buckled in to the side of the van shooting out the, the, the door and we were trying to time this thing so that, that these all the guys that were the trail builders were, were riding bikes down this trail and they kind of go over this rock and then there was a fork in it and they came back together. And we, I think we shot it at least, um, at least 10 times while we were doing it. And they were crossing as they were coming back together. One of them was going off one side of the rock and the other ones were going off in the other direction. So they were doing that kind of Lippenzahn or stallion cross, 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 cross. And there was five or six of them or maybe maybe four or five of them, I can't remember, but there were some really near misses where they were just buzzing each other's wheels as they were going by. And the last shot was one of the middle takes, I think. And you can see like, like the, the shot kind of develops and then, then there's this kid that comes towards frame and then the guy that had gone out the back of frame and then comes back in, they come into each other and they're, they're kind of converging back onto where this loop comes back together. And um, they just nearly ran into each other, but they were just giggling so much with laughter because what I was asking them to do was really fun and ridiculous. And, uh, and you can see this, this kid who's just, he's just got his tongue out, like laughing uncontrollably as they're nearly crashing into each other, you know, coming back on this, trail uh, through this field and it's this really long kind of pretty shot that we were able to pull off with very little equipment I mean that's like just sitting in the side of a van and going down down the road like if we had shot at any slower in frame rate it wouldn't have worked because it you know it took all the bumps out of it every time I do a film I try to do something that's like that I haven't done before just to see if it works and sometimes it makes it in the film if it works and sometimes if it doesn't work it doesn't make it in the film and so the opening shot, we, we, we shot the whole opening sequence in, on a Super 8 camera and, um, and scanned that. And, then, and that was kind of talking about the, the um, olden times of mountain biking. We got an old 90s mountain bike and that the producer, Izzy, is actually the one riding the bike there. And, sh and we kind of made it look like archival footage. And, <laughs> and I, wanted to, I wanted to make it look like like it felt like when I was a kid mountain biking. So I put her in clipless pedals, which she doesn't ride usually. So she's attached to the bike and it's this old beater bike and just made her basically ride through the woods. There really weren't any trails that she was riding on. And, and that where she tips over and, and crashes at the beginning of the film. And then we, we cut to that POV that smashed into the ground. That's actually her crashing there. And she, <laughs> at the end of the cut, she's just oh like, my gosh. yeah, at the end of the cut, she's just like, why do we have to do this? I'm like, it's real. Like you're really, you're really crashing. She's like, I know, I know I'm really crashing. So that was a lot of fun. But, um, so we, we transitioned from the, the super eight footage to like, uh, a, a
faux Super 8 um, that it was like a matte overlay that then the, the Super 8 bleeds away into a six, 16 by 9 frame, and, and that's that opening shot. And it's, it's, you know, these three guys riding through these rollers. And the way we achieved that, like I really needed a cable cam for it, but we didn't have it. So um, I just had a stick gimbal with a, with a, like the black magic pocket, I think. Um, and I'm just holding it with one hand and just sprinting through the woods as fast as I can, just down trail from them. And that one took us a while to get also because when I'm like running, I can't really see the frame. So I'd have to just eyeball it, you know, with my wrist to make sure that it was kind of framing the way we wanted it. And the timing was hard too, because it was in slow motion and they were, they were going really fast as we rode by. Um, so those two shots, that opening and closing shot were the, probably the trickiest to kind of, um, pull off. Sorry, that yeah. was really long. I <laughs> No, no, it's great to hear you talk about it that way because it totally translates in the film when you talk about like how much fun it seems to film, even though it was complicated, it really seemed like the bikers were having a great time. And when you talk about, especially like that end shot where the two mountain bikers and the kid almost intersect, it's like, you can really see that they had a great time filming this and they really enjoyed doing what they love to do. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's, it, I think it definitely comes through. Like there was a lot of stuff that we shot that we just couldn't use. Cause it was these, you know, for lack of a better term, like mountain biker bros that were just, all they wanted to do was like ride off of rocks that are just like practically vertical. And, uh, and at the end of the day, we were shooting all this stuff and, and, and Izzy and I looked at each other and we're like, this, like, we can't put this in the film because it's just, it was like shred footage, but that's not what the film was about. You know, the film was about, you know, community and, and what it like kind of bridging the gap, I guess the whole purpose of the film was bridging the gap between, you know, people that, that during COVID were like, cause this was shot, you know, kind of in the midst of all that, they, the bike industry just went through the roof and, and there was all these people that had mountain bikes, but they had no like easy access to get into it, especially in new England. You know, the trails in new England are so oftentimes just really pretty technical and it's just hard to get involved in that. So we didn't want to show, you know, 19 year old kids launching off of rocks, you know, down 60 degree slopes. But we've shot it anyways. So. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you talk about that community in New England, and I know in the film you talked a little bit about how the mountain biking community in New England is evolving. And I know you're a mountain biker, you did some mountain biking out west. Could you talk about how those communities are a little bit different and how you see that changing in New England? I think the film explains it pretty well. Um, like, I, I grew up mountain biking in New Hampshire. Um, you know, I was, I was an 80s kid, and, you know, we got... We got bikes and started with BMX bikes and, and those didn't ride off road particularly well. There was a film that like called Rad that was like one of my favorite films when I was a kid and that was about BMX biking. But um, they did like there were some sequences where they were just like they used the bikes were so utilitarian in that in that movie and some of the instances of it. So that's what we did. Me and my friends just like rode around all over the place and we were just on double track like logging road sort of things. We ended up scratching out kind of our own trails in our backyards too um and then you know s some of that changed some of that changed before i left new england i left new england in uh 2001 and and moved to san francisco and was living out there and and i had my bike with me um as well and and california mountain biking is just is is completely different it's it's not rooty and rocky and super technical. It's, there's huge climbs, there's huge, um, you know, descents, there's less rock in the area that I was and more dirt. So they're able to make the trails, cut the trails a little differently. Um, but it was, it was just so much more about fitness and like, you know, going fast out there. You know, I ended up moving back to New England. Um, I was in Littleton, New Hampshire for a number of years. And that was, I can't remember when that would have been. It would have been 2000, no, 10, 9, 8, somewhere around there. It was probably five or six years later, four, five, six year, years later. And I was biking more there, and that was more what I was familiar with, but the trail system was more developed there. And uh, I got into racing and, you know, raced 24-hour races and adventure racing and things like that. So it was all ultra-endurance sort of based things, but I always had those roots in that technical 
style of writing. So it was, it's very, you know, it was very different. And then we started riding this place called East Burke uh, in Vermont, and uh, they have a whole series of flow trails up there. They got some technical stuff too, but like it's, it's near St. Johnsbury, and they have, they had a, a trail called, I think, Tap and Die and Sidewinder or something like that, where they just went down these, these watersheds and they had these really smooth banked turns in them. And you, like it was the first time I'd ever ridden a flow trail and it just blew my mind. And we would go there all the time. It was probably a 20 or 30 minute drive from where we were. And we would go there a lot and ride and, and just had a blast with it. And, you know, that style of, of trail building just because it's so fun, because the giggle factor is so high, you get done, down on the bottom of like one of these trails, if it's a downhill or even if it's a cross country trail and there's not a lot of descending in it, you get done with the thing and you're just laughing uncontrollably like you were when you were a kid riding around. And at least that was my experience. So as a result of, of that, I think just they gained in popularity and more and more people, um, you know, want to ride that sort of stuff. So there's funding for that. And there's, there's, really skilled operators all over the country, probably the world, but all over the country who are, you know, they use excavators to, to cut these trails and, um, they've had to get really tricky with them. Like, you know, you think of this big, huge bowl that you're riding around, there's no drainage for that naturally. So they install like a PVC pipe with a rock garden above it. So it's completely covered over, you know, you don't notice it, but there's like this French drain that goes out into you know, the downhill side of the the thing. And that way, when it rains, the water, you know, will pool there for a bit, but then it just drains right out and it keeps the trail dry. And, you know, what happened when we were kids a lot was trails got really eroded because there'd be a puddle in the middle of the trail and nobody wants to ride through the puddle and just cover themselves in mud or cover their drivetrain in mud. So they'd ride around the puddle and then other people would ride around the other side. So they just kept getting bigger and bigger. And that's how that erosion happens. And then trails turn into garbage at that point. Um, so I think the difference between it is less so now um, because it's kind of, it started to, you know, happen. People are building these types of trails all over the place. So what are you working on now? What other projects have you been working on since this film? Um, well, so let's see. I shot that not last summer, but the summer before. Um, Gosh, I don't. Even, there's so many things that I've done um, since then. I mean, I do a lot of commercial work, um, whether it be actual commercials or or corporate stuff that that people need. Um, you know, I was prior to COVID happening. I was a fly and shoot DP, and so I had you know lenses and a camera, and off I would go and and uh, you know fly somewhere and grip and gaff and sound and everything was there for me um or we would hire it out and and that's that's how i worked for a long time and then covid hit and it everything changed because you just no one was flying anywhere and i learned like real quick i saw that kind of coming we had that first uh, i think it was probably like three or four weeks off i built my studio which this used to be a carport um off the back side of my house and we closed it all in and um, I used to work as a carpenter, so it was like trips to Home Depot and just start building stuff. And, and that's how I spent my days when COVID first happened. And then I got bored, uh, this thing got done. And then I'm like, what is this really going to look like? Um, you know, the future of filmmaking for me anyways. And I realized that I was going to have to meet some people locally to start making films with and start meeting some corporate clients locally because it wasn't going to be, you know, whisking way off to, you know, New York or LA or whatever to shoot. And, um, so, you know, I bought a van and, and a bunch of gaff, um, grip and gaff equipment and, and some other support that I needed. And, uh, and we started traveling around more locally and doing things. And the, the zoom interview became a huge thing where if you could have a zoom interface to, to have somebody remotely interview, someone. So I did a ton of those for that whole period of time, um, which opened up a lot of opportunities to go and do these types of, you know, small, pretty low budget documentaries, but still make them at a, at a high quality. And, um, we've shifted away 
from that a little bit and, you know, doing more commercial work again and, and still doing stuff kind of regionally um, and occasionally flying around to, to do that. But I think the industry's changed a little where people are realizing that they can hire local local people more often. Um, I'm actually, I just, the whole morning I was spent loading stuff and organizing. I'm pre-lighting a shoot uh, today after this and then uh, we're shooting tomorrow uh, for that and that's a commercial for a leather craftsman here in Charlotte. Um, and then I've got a couple other projects in the works. There's, there's a documentary that we're starting to kind of look at um, in that's based in Charlotte in a in a, a town of uh, during the 60s there was urban renewal that kind of came through Charlotte and, and like decimated this this section of the city um, in the name of development and we're kind of looking into that it's more of a historical doc um, and it you know we've ranged it started as oh let's just do this because it'll be fun and it'll be me and a couple other guys chance to work together and, and see if we, we make a good team and it just exploded into this massive project now um so we're kind of got that on the back burner um and then yeah just kind of kicking around doing small stuff also um you know the year let's see i guess it was the the july that i that i shot the july before i shot flow um which was we shot in september um and i attended moff that year while we were shooting that for another film that that you guys had in called go josie and um and so i had just bought an alexa mini lf um which is a, a fairly expensive camera and i had this huge camera payment so i worked my butt off for a year to pay that thing off and um and now i don't have that massive camera payment anymore so i'm like I don't really want to work as much, like less volume, higher quality, um, you know, and we'll still do that. And the winter is pretty slow in New England or in, uh, in Charlotte anyways, as opposed to New England, like there seems to be more shoots in New York and the winter states because you can get snow and it can look good. Whereas down here, everything's just brown and gray and rainy and, you know, kind of gross looking in the winter. So I've had a lot of time off and I'm, I'm excited about that. Um, so we got a few specs in the work, you know, a lot of, a lot of spec commercials we do this time of year and shoot stuff that we can then either try to sell or use as a portfolio piece to try to pitch an agency or a company on, on something. So pretty standard, really. Yeah, it sounds like you have a lot of stuff in the works and, and a lot of high quality stuff from what it sounds. Um, you talked a little bit about before COVID, you know, going to different states to shoot different places, New York, all these all these different places. But what was it like for you to shoot in Maine? And, and what are some of your favorite things about Maine? Um, you know, New England in the summer, I have a very soft spot in my heart for that area of the world. I would love to live there in the summertime. Um, you know, I, I grew up in Stratford, New Hampshire. Um, my family owns a, or my my dad's side of the family owned a dairy farm in half of that town. Um, you know, that's where I grew up. Just, you know, it's, it's a very special place to me. And there's not a lot, there's not a lot of difference between that side of the river and the other side of the river. Um, you know, my sister is an actress and she was in, um, countless summer shows in Prescott Park and, and Seacoast Repertory down in Portsmouth. And my mom lived in Kittery for um a long time then moved to south berwick she's since moved down here to charlotte because she's realized that the winters were were a lot nicer down here and um i don't know there's just something about new england it just feels different um than other parts of the world and i i really like that i think one of the biggest draws to coming back to maine is um i think it's holy donut in in portland <laughs> the, the, yeah. the, the donut yeah, shop there donut. that is just like, holy <laughs> donut yeah i'm like i'm such a sweet i have a huge sweet tooth and i love that and um and those are those man those are the best donuts in the world um and my buddy Stu, you know i grew up with Stu, uh the kind of the main subject of the film there um or the main you know narrator of the film and we met each other ski patrolling or teaching sailing actually, and then we were ski patrollers together at Gunstock and Ossipi or in uh, uh, Alton, and um, or was it in Guilford? Either way, 
we were ski patrollers together. We spent all this time doing silly things. We rode bikes all over the place together. So it was like, he still lives up there. He's got twins now. Um, his wife, Val, is a dentist um, in, in Waterford or in that area. So, yeah, it's, um, I don't know, something special about Maine. I've always loved there it. There definitely is. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree with you. And I'm also a huge fan of Holy Donut. <laughs> yeah. Definitely a reason to come back. <laughs> yeah. I One of the the sound mixers that I know down here, who lives in Asheville, actually, he does a lot of work with NASCAR. And at, during the Loudon race, he dawn patrolled to, um, I can't remember what their call time was, but it was probably eight or nine. And he dawn patrolled to Portland just to get donuts for the whole crew and came <laughs> back with it. And, uh, and they were like, the crew was like, where did you get these donuts? And he left, <laughs> like, whatever, 4 a.m., took off from Loudon to go you know, get, I think he got three or four dozen donuts from Holy Donut and brought them back to the crew and they were just like, you know, losing their mind. Yeah, they're worth it. I'll tell you that much. Yeah. Um, so where can folks see this film? Uh, they can see, Flo can be seen on, on Pearl Zumi's Insta, uh, no, Pearl Zumi's YouTube page. Um, I think if you just go there and type in Flo, you'll see it. Um, there's a bunch of content on that. Um, that's the best place to find it. Thank you, David, for sharing and, and speaking on your film today. We'll make sure to include those links to your film. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for uh, coming in. I'm going to zoom on back to the green screen now. And thank you guys for watching. This concludes this edition of The Moffs Filmmaker in Focus. I'm Meg Creel. Have a great day. Thanks for listening to Filmmaker in Focus, a podcast featuring the filmmakers of the Maine Outdoor Film Festival. You can watch David Stiles' film Flow in full online by visiting the Pearl Azumi YouTube page. And for more of David Stiles' work, visit davidnstiles.com or follow him on Instagram at davidnstiles. This episode was produced by Meg Friel and Nolan Lyon, with assistance from Andrew Burgess, Rory Ecker, Nick Callanan, Amber Veyu, and Brendan Donahue. For more episodes of Filmmaker in Focus, visit moff.film. This has been an intern-produced project of the Maine Outdoor Film Festival.